fields, you need not buy my book. All right, here it is. Is the answer the National Basketball Association, if you've heard this, tell me to stop and I'll go on to other things. Is the answer the National Basketball Association or the National Football League? Think carefully. Here are the questions. 36 have been accused of spousal abuse. Seven have been arrested for fraud. 19 have been accused of writing bad checks. Uh, you can erase, if you know the answer, you're 117 have directly or indirectly bankrupted at least two businesses. Three have done time for assault. 71, I repeat, 71 cannot get a credit card due to bad credit. 14 have been arrested on drug-related charges. Eight have been arrested for shoplifting currently and are defendants in lawsuits. And 84 have been arrested for drunk driving in the last year. Can you guess which organization this is? Yeah. The U.S. Congress. It is the U.S. Congress. <laughs> you are correct. And you do not have to buy my book. Both houses. That's right. It's, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, Mostly the House of Representatives. It's the House of Representatives, actually. Um, the senators are so. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's pure as In any event, I thought that was thematically appropriate to begin with because, as we all know, uh, it's taken for granted today. We live through what everybody calls a set, we're living through what everybody calls a second gilded age. Uh, one renowned for its sleaze, its monomania, its corruption, its crony capitalism, uh, and its kind of free market idolatry. Uh, and we all uh, know this, and this is uh, the record of this House of Representatives is exemplary of an, of an age that resembles in its, in its uh, immorality and selfishness, the first Gilded Age to which it's often uh, compared. I, I was reading just a few uh, weeks ago, the front page of the New York Times had two astounding stories. One, this is on the front page, and this is in the midst of this massive foreclosure subprime crisis. House may pass a bill to solve the housing crisis, which will benefit the auto industry, the energy industry, and several other industries I can't uh, remember now. The second front page story was a report that the top earning hedge fund manager had just cleared in 2007 $3.7 billion. The math on that is as follows. He made, in an hour, 30 times what the American family makes in a year. So, and I also did the math, I didn't really do this math, but I think if you were a kind of Neolithic stone scraper and started out somewhere back around 10,000 BC, you might be catching up to this guy uh, today, uh, given the minimum wage then, which was probably more or less like it is today. Anyway, uh, so we're, we're full of this stuff, and, and, and what, what's amazing to me is not only how long this gildedness has lasted, at least a quarter century or more, but how we've tolerated it, how, how it's lasted without virtually any protest. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating, but if you compare our second gilded age to the first gilded age, an era of apocalyptic upheaval all across the country, farmers and workers and even uh, ministers and novelists, the Populist Party, the Knights of Labor, the antitrust movement, there was an outpouring of cultural, political, and economic protest uh, directed against the ugliness of raw, barbaric industrial capitalism in the late 19th century. We live at a time when the same gross inequalities exist, the same crony capitalism exists, and yet we don't witness that same protest. Why? Very tough question. Don't know the answer. But my book about Wall Street is, I hope, a little suggestive about some parts of the answer. The book is very tiny, and it's just a, it has it, it talks about four images of the street and the history of those images, the way they've changed. The four are the aristocrat, the confidence man, the hero, and the immoralist. These are images of the street that have existed more or less since the beginning of the street, which begins basically with the American Revolution. The first Wall Street panic is in 1792 and continues obviously to the, to the present. 
So let me look at each one of those quickly, very quickly, to give you an idea of how they change. The aristocrat. The first Wall Street panic was generated by a to-the-manor born, lived on a Hudson River estate, had gone to school at Eton, uh, was very tight with Alexander Hamilton and others, and was an inside trader. He was, uh, uh, had liveried help, was in every other outward respect an aristocrat, but what he really was was a kind of a borning capitalist looking for the main chance to take advantage of his inside connections. For a long time, and he was hated, and for a long time in American history, the Wall Street buccaneer was seen as a kind of aristocrat. Uh, and the, the, the struggle against Wall Street was seen as a struggle against uh, aristocrats camouflaged as capitalists who were undoing democracy in America. And that goes all the way up even to Franklin Roosevelt, who talks about economic royalists and Tories of industry and talks about chasing the money changers from the temple of our civilization. The aristocrat is gone. He's vanished. That's one of the ways the image of the street has changed. When we talk about uh, 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 Wall Street tycoons today, and especially the ones who came to power in the, eight, in, the 18, in the 1980s and 90s, we talk about, well, the press talked about, I should say, rebels. Uh, 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 they were men from nowhere. Uh, Michael Milken grew up in a modest home in Encino, California, and still lives two doors from that home. Warren Buffett is just an ordinary guy like you and me. Uh, these people dress in blue jeans and cowboy hats. They do commercials calling for tax cuts for the rich, dressed in hard hats and dungarees. Uh, they have penetrated the whole electoral apparatus with an elaborate array of, lob of the whole K Street project, need I say more. They are Democrats. This is, and we don't talk about aristocrats anymore. And, and in fact, they came to power warring against the great Wall Street banks and corporations. They were ossified bureaucrats. They were unwilling to take risks. They were going to transform them, make them lean and mean, compete on the world market, and so on and so forth. They were rebels against capitalism in the interests of capitalism, not aristocrats. Take the confidence man. You know, uh, Mark Twain once said that, that a, a, a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing next to it. Uh, uh, you know, back in the, in the mid-19th century, uh, there was a famous case in New York. Some, some petty ante guy was running a, a you know, really small-time scam in New York City, kind of convincing people to loan them his watches, and then he would go off and, and promising them big riches and so on. Anyway, once upon a time, the confidence man was a small-time operator. And he operated on Wall Street. And there were bucket shops that tricked people into investing in stocks that didn't exist and so on. But he was a small timer. And even the street didn't like him uh, because it kind of blemished the reputation. What happened to the confidence man now? His name is Ken Lay. That is to say, he's dead. But in other words, Ken Lay lived in, a, in an economy that is informed by a huge bubble of, uh, of leveraged securities, many of them with no grounding at all in the real economy. Uh, we are now suffering all the consequences of that. And so what used to be the felonious activity of a small time operator or a bucket shop guy is now the system itself a highly leveraged system that operates by producing commodities called derivatives or collateralized debt obligations or structured investment vehicles whose creators don't even know how they operate, but they know they can fleece all kinds of people selling them. So that's what's happened to the confidence man over the course of that century. Take uh, the, the, uh, the, the hero. The, 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 take the hero. The hero was once a, a, a brute, but an empire builder. He built great industries, or he had some role in them. Vanderbilt, say, for example, to take an example. He was the upbuilder, we're giving him, I'm giving him too much credit, of the country's industry, but he was associated with it. What are the great heroes, the Michael Milkins, the Carl Eichens, uh, the Boskis of the 80s and 90s? 